This week has already been a wild roller coaster of news when it comes to the world of Destiny 2. But since today is a Thursday, you guys know what that means. It's time for another issue of the Bungie Weekly blog, This Week at Bungie, for the week of December 5th, 2019. And we're going to be learning even more about the incoming season of Dawn. In this issue, we learn about some quality of life changes, some incoming sandbox changes, and even a bit about the current state of the Eververse store. Let's go ahead and dive right on in. Now, if you've missed any of the previous big bits of news for the week, we did have the Bungie reveal stream happen yesterday, where they went in and they showed off the brand new six-man activity in Season of Dawn, the Sundial. We also got a sneak peek at the new artifact as well as some incoming mods. But if you missed any of that stuff, the breakdown trailer we got earlier in the week, we'll have links to all of our coverage videos for that down in the description box below. Go check them out. But for right now, let's dive on into the TWAB. First things first, we've got some major changes coming in next week's update. We talked about some of the incoming solar subclass changes last week, but this week we've got some changes coming to other subclasses as well as some pretty decent quality of life changes going into effect on Tuesday. The first section here is going to deal with in-game rewards. First up, they've increased the drop rate of the Scourge of the Past Raid Exotic Anarchy from 5% up to 10%. This is kind of like what they did with the Thousand Voices way back in Forsaken. Next, the Exotic Engram and the Faded Engram from Xur have been collapsed into a single new Exotic Engram item. When opened, it awards a new Exotic if any remain to be collected. Otherwise, it contains a random piece of Exotic gear. And the content you pick up on that Engram will still be class specific. So if you're on a Warlock, you're still going to pick up Warlock gear. If you're on a Titan, you're still going to pick up Titan gear. This is actually really interesting. It means any of the exotic engrams, whether you get one out in the wild, possibly whether you get one from the incoming season pass, all of it is basically going to be given the same sort of purpose that Xur's faded engram has. Hopefully allowing you to get your hands on some of the free-floating exotics out there that you haven't gotten yet. So that's definitely nice to hear. After that, we learn a bit more about how powerful and pinnacle rewards are going to be changing when Season of Dawn begins. This is actually a point of conversation since it wasn't really covered in the initial reveal stream or the reveal trailer for Season of Dawn itself, but we are indeed getting a raise in our power level. The current hard cap for powerful rewards is 950. That's going to be moving up 10 power levels to 960. And the current pinnacle cap of 960 is moving up 10 up to 970. So if you're wondering if we were going to be seeing a power level increase, like a base increase to our soft cap and our hard cap, yes, we are. Glad they cleared that up. After that, we've got some more quality of life changes, including a major one coming to Escalation Protocol. The Escalation Protocol Wave 7 chest no longer requires a key to open. The chest can be opened upon every successful completion of Wave 7. This is major. Each time, opening the chest awards one piece of Escalation Protocol armor for your character class until you have the full set. After the full set is acquired, subsequent openings of the chest awards a random piece of armor. This means you can head off to Mars once this update goes live next week, play some Escalation Protocol, and in one sitting, get the full Escalation Protocol armor without having to worry about, you know, decrypting and encrypting those cash keys. Which is a fantastic change, if you ask me. It's going to allow you to go off and grind up that full armor set before you know it. And of course, with this change, charged decryption keys and key fragments are being removed from the game. These items will also be removed from player inventories. However, armory keys to spawn the Valkyrie Javelins are unchanged and will remain. Finally, Escalation Protocol weapon drops were not touched and are still cumulative stream boss drops. Basically, that means the longer you play it, if you haven't gotten a drop, the better your chance at getting an EP weapon will be. Great changes to Escalation Protocol overall. After that, we've got a couple of small changes. For weapon mods, the cost of slotting a weapon mod has been reduced from 5,000 Glimmer down to 500 Glimmer. Thank you. They also fixed an issue where 801 could grant duplicate weapon mods. Then we've got some changes coming to bounties. Here, Bungie's going to be simplifying a lot of the bounties that we take part in over the course of the game. First, repeatable bounties have been added to the Gunsmith. Thank you. They've also merged the Strike, Crucible, and Gambit objectives on the Gunsmith Weekly Bounty Field Calibration into a single objective that shares progress from all sources. Super psyched to hear this. This is that one bounty that Banshee has every week that that like required you to play Strikes and Crucible and Gambit. 
oh, this is all going to be one objective now. So thankfully, you're probably going to be able to go play whatever you want, whether you want to play Strikes, whether you want to play Crucible, whether you want to play Gambit, and get this bounty done. Very happy with this change. You can't make me play Gambit, Banshee. Anyways, moving on, they've removed the Valor and Infamy and Vanguard tokens from field calibration as there is no longer a requirement for any of these linked activities. Next, they've added new mode-specific daily Crucible bounties, one per day, selected from full-time playlists and active rotators. They've also reduced the completion requirements of several daily and repeatable Crucible bounties, so you're basically going to be able to complete those bounties a little bit easier. Finally, the biggest change for Crucible bounties here, they've removed grenade and melee bounties from the Crucible bounty repeatable pool. No more of those get 20 grenade kills in the Crucible bounties. Very happy to see that change there. But all right, those are the quality of life changes we've got to look forward to in next week's update. Next up are some sandbox changes coming to some of the game's subclasses. And first up, we've got the Striker Code of the Missile Middle Path. For Thunder Crash, they've increased the base damage of that super from 2700 damage to 3200 damage. They've also increased the in-flight damage from 100 to 200, and they've slightly increased the amount of time you have in air after activation. So I guess to kind of plan out and aim where you're going to be going. I am very happy to hear that they're making changes to the code of the missile. That super, Thunder Crash right now, is just painfully underutilized in PvE. Hopefully this increase in damage will make it a little bit better there. Next up, we've got the Night Stalker's Way of the Pathfinder. This is the bottom path. We've got a change coming to the ability Vanish in Smoke. They've added a short period of about 0.8 seconds after the invisibility is applied where firing weapons or performing other actions will not break invisibility. This should help prevent allies from accidentally breaking invisibility the moment it's granted to them if unexpected. Neat change there. Then we've got a change to the Voidwalker's Attunement of Fission. This is the middle tree path. Handheld Supernova. I was crossing my fingers as I read this the first time. I was like, oh no, here it comes. They're about to nerf my pocket nuke. But nope, not that. They've adjusted the grenade's charge time so it lines up with the animations in FX. This should make it feel more consistent to activate. So no nerf to the handheld Supernova. They just changed the way it looks a little bit. Super relieved to read that. Finally, we've got some changes coming to Crucible maps. They've added Rusted Lands to appropriate playlists, and they've added the Dead Cliffs, Legion's Gulch, Retribution, and Solitude to appropriate playlists as well. But they've removed Emperor's Respite, Equinox, Firebase Echo, and Vostok from all Crucible playlists. These maps are still, however, available to play in private matches. There we go. We knew some of this was going to happen. Uh, super psyched about Rusted Lands. That was revealed earlier in this week. I had no idea that they were going to be removing Vostok from everything. I mean, I, I, I won't complain too much. Vostok is probably my least favorite Crucible map in the game. But I am pretty surprised to see that it was on the list of things that they were going to completely remove from all Crucible playlists except private games. Hopefully they'll retune some of those maps and bring them back at a later date. But all right, there we go, Guardians. That is it for the big sandbox and quality of life changes that we're going to be looking forward to next week, at least the ones they wanted to cover in this week's TWAB. But it's not exactly everything that they wanted to talk about in this week's issue. There was a really interesting section of the TWAB that I wanted to bring up really quickly that addressed some of the current complaints and concerns about the Eververse store. In particular, the frequency with which some of the new items in the Eververse store are made available for Bright Dust and the sources of Bright Dust in the game right now. now. You guys know me. Personally, I don't really have too many problems with Eververse right now since, you know, Bungie's on their own. There's no more Activision in the picture. I have no problem with them utilizing a microtransaction store for Glamour items. But as I've said on previous videos and in the podcast and stuff like that, it is a little bit curious, the pricing structure in Eververse. That's probably my biggest issue with it. For example, I'll, I'll bring up the... Festival of the Lost Spooky Skeleton Armor. Those things went for like 1,500 Bright Dust apiece. That's 15 bucks. The Eververse Armor, those armor sets, were more expensive than the Season of Undying that they were a part of. So I think Bungie definitely could probably do a bit of restructuring of the Eververse store, especially with some of the prices of the things that they sell. 
Additionally, I have a big problem with the way they changed the sources of Bright Dust. Of course, back before Shadowkeep came out, they changed it so that all of the previous Eververse items like ships, sparrows, ghosts, and some shaders and stuff like that could be decrypted for Bright Dust. They changed it so that all that stuff decrypts into either Glimmer or like Legendary Shards, and Bright Dust only comes from some of those weekly bounties that are going to be available from like the Crucible and whatnot. Thankfully, all of that is addressed at least a little bit here. If you're somebody who was unhappy with the frequency with which some of these Eververse items were going on sale for Bright Dust, they say here that they're looking to increase the availability of Eververse items, new seasonal items that are going to be available for Bright Dust in the Season of Dawn. And additionally, when the Season of Dawn rolls around on December 10th, all dawning weekly and repeatable bounties will award Bright Dust in quantities equal to the amount awarded from Strike, Crucible, and Gambit Bounties. So for those, the weekly bounties give you about 200 Bright Dust per weekly bounty and 10 Bright Dust per repeatable bounty. And that Crimson Days will do the same for weekly bounties only. So basically, when the Dawning event goes live later this month, all of the bounties that are tied to that are going to grant you Bright Dust, hopefully allowing you to build up your reservoir of Bright Dust so you can start buying the Eververse items you want with in-game currency rather than having to whip out your wallet. Very happy to hear that, although I would argue I, I I get what they were trying to do with this, and I'm happy that they're going to be making this stuff available with Bright Dust more often, but I don't know why they got rid of the Eververse bounties that you could just do on like a daily or weekly basis in the first place. Just seemed a little bit weird to me, but I am happy that they're going to be expanding the sources of Bright Dust we have in the game right now, because it definitely feels like there's nowhere near enough Bright Dust that you can earn by playing the game to afford all of the things that they're selling. So, I'm happy to see that in effect. And of course, they go on to state here that they're always taking player feedback into account and they'll be further adjusting this system as they move forward. But alright Guardians, that is pretty much it for the biggest bits of news contained in this week's issue of the Bungie Weekly Blog, This Week at Bungie. We are finally at the tail end of the Season of the Undying, so if there's any more triumphs you're trying to earn, or if there are still a few things on the Season Pass track that you've yet to claim, make sure you get that done before next Tuesday, because it's all going to be going away. But alright, that is it for this one, Guardians. That's the news. Those are my thoughts. Be sure to leave me yours down in the comment section below. How do you feel about the Eververse changes they're talking about here? What would you like to see them do with the Eververse store in the future? Be sure to let me know. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to drop a like. Make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell to stay up to date with all the latest stuff we're putting out. But alright, that's it for this one. I'm out for now. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I am the Black Link. You Guardians, stay frosty.